less than full yeah. screen mode. Okay, that doesn't work. Um, okay, then. Uh, let, me, let me just uh, stop sharing for a moment. Um, as then, then, I, then, I can, then I can share just a section of the screen because it's handy to show my cursor, I think. Otherwise, I need to. Mm. Uh, I need to say, uh, okay. Then, um, sure. I mean, let me just uh, stop sharing for a moment. Um, is then, I, then, I, then, I can, then I can share just a section of the screen because it's handy to show my cursor, I think. Otherwise, I need to, mm. uh, I need to say, uh, okay. Then, um, sure. I mean, let me just uh, stop sharing for a moment. Um, then, then, I, then, I can, then I can share just a section of the screen because it's handy to show my cursor. Well. Can you see it just now? We yeah. can see the cursor. Okay, good. Excellent. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Satwik, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you everyone for uh, joining us for the PICO seminar series, which is a part of the PICO Electrodynamics Theory Network, which we have initiated. So this aim of this theory network is to bring in diverse field of researchers working in the field of the topological physics, density functional theory, many body physics, and uh, many, many such areas, computational electrodynamics, to really look into the, the electrodynamic phenomena deep inside matter in the picoscopic level. So the aim of this network is to bring in these researchers so that uh, there is an active collaboration and also uh, to push this field of the speak electrodynamics deep inside the matter. And uh, so as a part of this network, we are following this PICO seminar series, which will be live streamed in YouTube. And uh, uh, with this, uh, with the, our third speaker in this seminar is Pro Professor uh, Robert John Slager from University of Cambridge and now uh, Professor Zubin Jacob will introduce him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Satwik. Um, and thank you to everyone joining us. Um, I am very uh, happy to share that we'll have uh, Professor Robert Jan Slager, um, who's going to speak to us about um, some really advanced um, ideas that he was actually a pioneer in bringing to the field on um, a, a contemporary view on topological band theory. And um, just to tell you a little bit about um, Dr. Slager, so he is currently a principal investigator at the University of Cambridge um, in the UK, and uh, he obtained his PhD in theoretical condensed matter physics from Leiden University, and he also worked as post, he had postdoctoral stints at both the Max Planck Institute uh, for the Physics of Complex Systems and Harvard University. So he has a very long list of accolades, so I will not go through it, uh, but some of them uh, is really the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship <laughs> for the New Investigator Award uh, from the UK RI. Um, he has a very broad range of interests um, and is really one of the people who has pushed uh, topological band theory into new directions. And we've been very, um, we've had a great time collaborating with him on uh, a recent paper that we wrote with uh, Todd Van Mechelen and Sathwick on topological optical N insulators and how the topological obstructions form in the atomistic susceptibility tensor. And we are looking forward to more discussions and um, possibly more papers to write with uh, Professor Ye uh, Jan Slager. So with that, um, Robert, we are eagerly looking forward to your talk. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the invitation and a very, very nice introduction. Uh, let's see if I can do it justice. Um, so you can still see the, the, the my cursor, right? Or, yes. Um, Okay, fantastic. So yeah, um, I, so uh, what I want to talk to uh, talk to you all about today is somewhat of a general overview of like topological band theory and some of the things that we did in the past, um, which has resulted, or which is like um, has is relates to symmetry indicators and and topological quantum chemistry. But on the the second part of the talk, I also want to talk about new stuff, uh, which actually goes beyond this kind of approaches. Uh, that are based on symmetry indicated eigenvalues. And I will try to make this explicit of what I mean with that. And the talk is designed to be quite broad. So sometimes I skip over things. So uh, it's really hard to condense everything into, into an hour to 
like give every nitty gritty detail, but um, of course uh, we can have a discussion afterwards, but the idea is to at least convey the main ideas. So don't worry if not everything is clear, uh, like every, every nitty gritty formula, but at least I hope the idea can be conveyed. Okay. So what I want to talk about today is, as, as I said, we, we are talking about like, like, uh, like uh, band theory. So, you know, in Commerce Matter, if you're interested in, 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 you're basically interested in how order arises from a large number of constituents like atoms or ions or um, what kind of system you're looking at. And uh, of course, this has been done for a long time using the lambda paradigm where you use symmetry. So a crystal is different from a liquid because a crystal breaks rotations and translations of space time. Okay. But since like quantum Hall effects and actually also super high, super high TC, there has been a very different idea of how to classify order and it's by, use, by the use of topology, okay? So topology is really like studying, uh, um, uh, studying properties of objects that are preserved under smooth transformation. So when I think about that, the classical example is like a donut is the same topologically as a, as a coffee cup because the, the thing that's really invariant are the number of holes and that doesn't change from the donut to the coffee cup. There's one, I can stick my finger through it and if I'm only con considering properties that are invariant under smooth deformations, you can, if you think about this, this coffee cup made of rubber, there are a lot of animations of how one can deform it into a donut, okay? So this idea of topology is a very different idea from symmetry, but it's equally powerful in actually uh, describing order and how order arises, okay? And there's actually two main streams in there that can be like, if you have like, intrinsic kind of topological order. So then you're thinking about fractional quantum Hall effect. So you have edge states and you have fractionalized excitations and you have like a ground state degeneracy of your manifolds, okay? Um, but these, these, these phases are generally hard, not so hard to make in the lab, but you have to go very high magnetic field to get a, a fractional quantum Hall state, okay? And now on the other hand, since like, the, like 2005 or something, we know that actually this, a lot of these topological things can come for free in some of the more simpler systems, which are actually nearly freely, uh, nearly free electron systems. Okay, and the way this comes about is that you can actually get topology, but not in, in the intrinsic form, but actually by combination with symmetry. So what that means is that you, there are systems like just that are weakly interacting. So simple band theory that get like topological notions just because there are symmetries in the system, and that's why people call them symmetry protected topological states, and that is kind of the the area of the map where we will be vacating today, okay? And um, so once, this, uh, once people knew that this kind of, topo this kind of topological notions can, can come about in, in free systems, it was actually uh, um, uh, Kitaev and, and Furusaki and Ludwig and, and Schneider that quickly drew up a table, okay? And so what this table kind of conveys is what is this topological invariant that we're talking about? So how many different topological phases are there? And uh, depending on, on the symmetries that I, I, I just talked about. So in particular, if you, if you think about time reversal symmetry, which is here, this theta, uh, particle hole symmetry, which is this sign here, and um, the, the product, which is chiral symmetry, you can actually, determine whether they are whether they are whether the system symmetry is present and to what value it squares so you know that for example time reversal symmetry can square to plus or minus one depending whether they're bosons or fermions and that's why you have this plus or minus ones in this column okay so there's like zero plus or minus one possibilities but there's a dependency that once you have this is the product of of, of, of time reverse symmetry and and, 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 and particle hole symmetry uh, but then there's one in which these ones are zero and this one is one. So there are 10 different classes, okay? So there are 10 different classes and what they tell you these columns is whether I have a time reversal symmetry or particle hole symmetry and chiral symmetry and, and to what value the operator squares, okay? And then in this table, depending on the dimension, you see like Z and Z2. So that means that uh, this table is like, it uses some, some more mathematical uh, um, uh, background, which is k theory, which we'll not go into today or not, not very explicitly. But the point is that you can use this kind of black box in, in this case, but it's not a black box, but like deeper mathematical ideas of how one and he can actually draw up this table. So k theory in very crude sense uh, classifies this, this, this band theories, but with the addition that I'm allowed to add very free bands, very, up, very high up in energy or very low in energy. So if I have two bands, 
that have a topological uh, value, so a topological invariant, I want to be able to have it stable in a, in a real system. So I want to be able to add as many bands high up in energy or low in energy. And K theory is like a way to achieve that. So it has a stable equivalence, what people call. But then when you see the stable, you see a Z. So in, in for example, in, in class A, when, when there's no particle hole symmetry and no time reverse symmetry and no chiral symmetry, you see the Z and this is this quantum Hall effect. So there's Z different phases, like an integer number of phases, okay? Another one is like, this is like a more, more, the more, most well-known that's in class A2. So when I have, when I have free fermion matter with, with time reversal symmetry, so time reversal symmetry squaring to minus one because it's fermion, fermionic stuff that I want to look at, you see that I get the Z2 and in, in two dimension and three dimension, these are the famous time reversal invariant protected topological insulators. So they, they come about again they come about by having a symmetry in the system, in this case, time reversal symmetry, which squares to minus one, okay? And they actually stem from a 4D quantum Hall effect that has time reversal invariance. But if you just look at this like two and 3D cases, you can directly see that symmetry is crucial because if I have time reversal symmetry and it squares to minus one, then you have something that's called Kramer's degeneracy. So that means that if I have a spin up, if I do time reversal symmetry on it, I have, will get the spin down in the, in the SZ basis, right? So to, to maintain time reversal symmetry, you will need to have degeneracies, uh, which are called Kramer's degeneracies at, at points at which the Hamiltonian commutes with time reversal symmetry. So with those points in the, in the brew and so on. So when I would go to the edge, this means that there are actually two of those points. So let's say zero, excuse me, zero and pi, which is gamma A and gamma B. And now you see because of the constraint of symmetry, these bands have to be degenerate at this gamma A and gamma B points, okay? And then you can see that I can either connect them pairwise like here, or I can connect them like, like the zigzag. These both, both satisfy the condition of having time reversal symmetry and having, having uh, uh, Kramer's degeneracies here, okay? But now you see indeed that there's a difference between the two because if I do perturbations and I, I can just smoothly this, the, 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 get this two band down, you will see that the crossings can go from two to, to zero, right? Whereas where here, I, I'm always stuck with an odd number of crossings. So I can pull this band down, but we'll always have an odd number of crossings, okay? So you see that there's indeed, if I go to the edge and the, 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 I, I consider of how these claimers points are linked, is, is that there's a difference between having an even number of crossings or an odd number of crossings of the Fermi surface, okay? And so, you, and, but this is all fill, comes from the fact that here the bands are, have to be degenerate at this high symmetry points. So you see that the Z2, there's really two different possibilities. So Z2 really means like zero or one. That is the, the, all the possibilities. There's two different topological possibilities because I cannot go from this one to this one. So there's really two different classes. All the even ones are connected. All the odd ones are connected. And uh, this one turns out to be having edge state. So this one will always have an edge state on the, on the boundary. And this is what is the famous TI. But you see, it's a really a, an idea of topology and symmetry coming together. But the, the symmetry is cu crucial, okay? But then you can ask the next, next question, if symmetries are so cr crucial, what about like uh, actually fundamental symmetries like lattice symmetries? Because if I want to talk about like a band theory, if I have free fermions and I want to talk about the band theory, I need to have a crystal in the first place because if I don't, I would not have a band, uh, band structure. I will just have free fermions in the box. So given the fact that we are talking about symmetry protected topological states, the question is, what is, does the symmetry that's always on board, the lattice, actually bring you, okay? So that will be kind of the, like a main line in the talk, like, okay, so we always have crystalline symmetries on, on board. How does this enrich this table? Sorry. So um, if, I, if, um, if you look at this table, this is all good and well, but remember that we only specified time reversal symmetry, uh, particle hole symmetry, and the product chiral symmetry. So this table has a lot of information, but it doesn't encode the crystalline symmetries at all. And given that there are symmetry protected topological states, of course, there is an idea that this should enrich the classification and also enrich the number of possibilities that one can account for, okay? So that's kind of the idea of the talk. And um, the idea is that recently, since 2016, 2017, there has been quite a lot of progress uh, on symmetry indicators and topological chemistry, which are based on the gluing condition that I will talk about in a minute. And that's kind of the first part of the talk, just to review that because it's it's kind of still contem contemporary because a lot of people are still uh, using this this techniques very successfully and insightfully 
to get new kind of topological to find new topological materials, etc. What I want then in the second part of the talk, I want to say that uh, okay, so this is all nice and this is still a very active field, but actually we in the past one and a half or two years or so we have been kind of uh, exploring some new kind of topology which we I will. Uh, referred to as multi-gap or Euler topologies, and I will try to convince you why they are new, and also that they are new, and but also uh, why they are new and uh, how they work, and because they work fundamentally different than this ones, uh, and uh, that's why, why why we are excited about that. Okay, so the part. So first, I will review a little bit of the symmetry indicators and why this is still very contemporary. But then, in the second part of the talk, I want to also show this new kind of stuff, uh, which we are quite excited about. Okay, so. Um, as I said, this this, uh, this this tenfold way that I just talked about here, this comes from something called K theory. So K theory is like some more mathematical theory that um, that that allows you to classify these phases up to stable equivalence. So when I'm allowed to add as many bands as I want, that don't do anything. So in the sense that if I have some topological notion and I add bands very high up in energy or very low in energy, it doesn't stay. This that this this classification is stable to that. And this is of course what I want. So what I really want is if if I want to I want to uh, look at this table, but instead of only having time reversal symmetry, particle hole symmetry, and and the product of chiral symmetry, I actually want to enrich them with the with the crystalline symmetries, which is of course a daunting task, because there are many crystalline symmetries to think about. Okay. Now, the in, and but and, and in particular, I want to do this in in some like the K theory kind of way, which is mathematically exhaustive. Okay. In some sense, that you have a well-defined mathematical construct. The only problem is that if I want to enrich the K theory with this crystalline symmetries, the, 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 the K theory becomes more complicated, and what mathematicians would call twisted equivariant K theory. And that means that the K theory dep starts depending on momentum. And you know that because I will I will show you in a moment a, a, an example. But if you have, for example, four fold rotations it will commute with the Hamiltonian at certain points in the Brill and zone, not like globally. Time reverse symmetry acts k uh, uh, to minus k on each point. But uh, for example, C4 rotations will act differently at, at 0, 0, because it put the same, or at pi pi, because it will map to the same point, whereas on, in, in another point, it will act generally different. So it will only, in other words, it will only commute with the Hamiltonian at certain points in the Brill and zone, actually. And, and that's why you can already guess that this K theory, if you want to do that, of course, I'm not going to explain K theory, but it becomes more complicated becomes it becomes it becomes dependent of the of the space group, the, the, the symmetry of the lattice that I'm interested in that I encode with G, but it becomes also dependent on momentum. Okay, and that's just a hard problem to solve. Okay. Um, and um, it was already like already uh, people with the more like in mathematical physics had, had like kind of post of how to how to maybe combine this. But what I will show you is that something that we uh, that we that we uh, discovered in these papers is actually that there's a very easy way to calculate this K theory, which is quite profound mathematically, but by just doing very simple things, okay, and just actually counting. And the idea is here. The idea is here, that, and that's something you should keep in the back of your mind all the time, is that everything is actually determined by how things connect, okay? And what I mean with that is that, let's say that I have two bands and they have some symmetry label. So if I'm considering inversion symmetry, there can be some band that has a plus inversion and one has a minus inversion uh, action. So when I act with the inversion symmetry on the wave function, it either returns the same one or minus the same one. So a plus and a minus band, and to really go from, from, from a trivial phase to a topological phase, by definition, I cannot smoothly deform them, so I need to do a band inversion, right? So that means that if I had the band that went from blue to blue and from red to red, if I did this band inversion, now it will, go, it will change character. So this topological one has the idea that I changed character from one point to the other. So it went from red to blue, and from, from blue to red, and that's because I did the band inversion in, 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 in the in between, right? Because by definition, I need to do that. And this idea is just the whole idea that you actually need to solve this K theory. And that's what we showed, okay? So um, just to, I will not do the proof today, but I want to just walk through a specific example because it shows all the techn technology that you need, okay? And if you want to know the proof, you can just read the paper. But the idea is as follows. So remember that we are only, everything is determined of how things connect. 
So let's do that for a specific example. Okay, so let's say that we just have a square lattice and I want to take it and I, I don't have any time reversal symmetry or particle hole symmetry or chiral symmetry. So I, I only am interested in the action of the lattice and I want to map out all these different topological phases. Okay, and as I said, everything is determined of how things connect. Now, to do so, uh, let's just do this algor uh, algor algorithmically and then just leave the proof for another time. But just walking through how this is calculated, I think is really very insightful, okay? And as I said, the whole idea is how things connect. So now let's make this concrete. So remember that if I have a square lattice in, 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 in real space, so this is in real space, then in, in momentum space, square lattice looks the same. It's still a, a squarish brew and so on. And the first thing you notice that if I have crystalline symmetries is that you don't need the whole Brio on. So in particular, if I have four-fold rotations and I do mirrors, you can see I can cover the whole plane. So if I do four-fold rotations and, and mirrors, I can cover the whole Brio on. So this is minus pi pi, this is pi pi. So I actually only need the red triangle. So the first step is actually to determine only the smallest piece that I need. The rest is just du du duplicate information anyway, okay? Then the second thing is that uh, remember that here I was talking about like how things connect, but I kind of assume that I go from one special point to another special point. And what I mean with special point is what something that I would make concrete now is special points are those that are live in the real ones on that get mapped to themselves under the symmetry. Okay, so remember that if we have a square lattice, then we have fourfold rotations and a mirror in the x and in the y direction. So if I then think about points that get mapped to themselves you see that there are special points that are left, uh, that are mapped to themselves by more than the identity, okay? So any point that I take in the real ones on, so let's say I take this point here, if I apply the identity to that, of course it gets mapped to itself. So kx, ky, if I apply identity to it, just identity matrix, it will go to kx, ky. But there are points that are left invariant by more, and that's what I would uh, refer to as special points. Um, and so in particular, as an example, you see, for example, if I would go to the, the gamma point, which is zero, zero, if I do fourfold rotations around zero, zero, I get mapped to myself, okay? But also when I do the mirror in the X or in the Y direction, also the zero, zero goes to itself because zero, zero, if I do any matrix, it goes to zero, zero again, okay? So this point is left invariant by fourfold rotations, but also the mirror in the X and in the Y direction, right? So basically by everything that is in, in the point group symmetry. So you know that if you have this plane, I can look at the point and in the point, I also only have fourfold and rotations and mirror in the X and the mirror in the Y direction, okay? So the action that is like leaving local points invariant is called the little co-group. So that depends on K on each point. So points that are left invariant by more than the identity, they have a non-trivial co-group and those are the special points that are defined. So as I said, the gamma point is an example because if I do fourfold rotations, it's get mapped to itself, but also by both of the mirror. Another such point is, for example, the endpoint. Because if I think about the endpoint, if I do a fourfold rotation, that gets mapped to the same point modulo lattice translation, right? So if I do a fourfold rotation, it goes from this point is pi pi, this point is pi pi, it will go to this point minus pi uh, pi, okay? Or minus pi minus pi. But these are all the point, same points in that modulo lattice translation. So fourfold rotations map M to the same point M. But also, if I do a mirror in the x direction, it gets mapped to itself. So if I do it along kx, then this m goes to the same m modulo lattice translation. Or when I map it in the, in the y direction as well, because this point uh, uh, pi zero will go to, the, to minus pi zero, which is again, the same point. So actually this point m also is left invariant by uh, everything, like the, by, by, the, by the fourfold rotations and by the mirror in the x and the mirror in the y direction, just like the gamma point, okay? But there's another special point, which is then different, and that is the X point, because if I do a fourfold rotation, this point zero pi, uh, sorry, pi zero will go to zero pi. So that's another point modulo, I mean, this is not related by lattice translation. So this is a different point, but it is left invariant by both of the mirrors. So if I do a mirror in the KX, if this is like, this is point zero pi, so if I do a KX mirror, it gets mapped to zero pi to itself. Or when I do it in the y direction, uh, sorry, along the ky axis, then it goes from pi zero to uh, minus pi zero, which is again the same point modulo lattice translation. So you see that this x point is not left invariant by a fourfold rotation, but it is left invariant by two mirrors, like the x and the y, both of them. So now we have our three special points. So the gamma and m we talked about is fourfold rotations and both mirrors. So the, the thing 
and mathematically speaking, that least invariant is the complete point group. So everything there is like D4 and both mirrors. And whereas the X point is only left invariant by the two mirrors. So the two mirrors are actually Z2 times D2 because you do, you know, if you do a mirror twice, you get back to yourself, right? So if you, if you take your mirror image and you do another mirror image of yourself, you're mapped to yourself. So that's why this is a Z2 quantity. If I square it, I always get to myself back. So they can only have eigenvalues plus or minus one. Okay. Um, so that's why the, the X point has a, like two mirrors, which is basically that the, 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 the group that is invariant are two mirrors. So the Z2 times Z2. Okay. But uh, there is there. So, and now, and now comes the, the crucial thing is that. Okay, so if I have some special point and I have by definition chosen my special point such that they are left invariant. So when I do a fourfold rotation or a mirror on this gamma point, it gets mapped to itself. That means that the Hamiltonian needs to commute with that, with that operation at that uh, momentum. So at, at zero, 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 so uh, sorry, at, at gamma, so at zero, zero momentum, the Hamiltonian needs to commute by definition with the fourfold rotations and the both mirrors, because by definition we already said that k goes to my to k goes to itself. So that means that if I think about h of k, Hamiltonian depends on k. If I do then a transformation, which is like inverse transformation of momenta, but momenta get mapped to themselves, that means that the Hamiltonian stays the same. So the Hamiltonian commutes with 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 these things. And in other words, then to say it more fancy, that means that if I, I can I can diagonalize my Hamiltonian. Of, uh, and, and the D4 symmetry at the same time. So it makes sense to attach symmetry labels which count uh, uh, how this band's transformed. So that's what called, what people call irreducible representations. So I can always represent my D4 operator. So I have here my D4 operator and I can always represent it as some matrix that, are, that does the operation. And this matrix has like small building blocks. So I can build all every matrix that do the does the D4 operation from the small building blocks, and these building blocks are irreps. And by definition, because they commute at this point, they need to be. Uh, it's an eigenstate of both star, star, uh, things. So I can attach the symmetry labels. So what the symmetry labels here mean is just that how many bands? That's a well-defined question. Transform in that irreducible representation at that symmetry point. Okay, so. I said that this gamma point, this is uh, the bands have to transform in an irrep. So I can count how many, and I can, I can first look up how many different irreps there are of D4, there turns out to be five. And I can ask each of these bands, how, in which irrep do you transform? That's a well-defined question because they commute at that point. So it's, you can, uh, the, the, the asking like the symmetry labels of D4 operator and the Hamiltonian at the same time can be done. It's meaningful. So every band has to transform in an irrep, and this this uh, this um, uh, this numbers count how many are transforming in that irrep. So to be concrete, n gamma three here counts how many bands are transforming in irreducible number uh, irrep no, number three at the gamma point. Okay, and similarly, if I have n five m, there's so many bands transforming in 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 irre irreducible representation number five at the end point. Okay. Uh, and so for D4, there are five irreps, so I just need five integers to count how many bands are transforming each of these irreps. And uh, for, for Z2 times Z2, there's only four, it can be even, odd, odd, even, 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 or odd, odd. And I can count, hey, how many bands are transforming even in the mirror in the X and in the Y, or even, odd, or odd, odd, or even, odd. Okay, so this should be a three. But so th these are just the different irreps, and this is this this number is an integer counts how many bands are transforming in, in, in that irrep. That's the well-defined question. Okay, but of course all these numbers here are not are not uh, mutually independent. Okay, so what I mean with that is that okay, so this band this band this this number here n one gamma counts how many bands are transforming in irrep number one at the gamma point, and five trans uh, counts how many bands transforms in five. Um, at the gamma point, but if I sum all these integers, then I need to get the number of bands back because each band has to transform in one of them, right? So if I count how many bands are transforming in this one, 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 and I add them, that's the total number of bands. So, and the total number of bands doesn't change. So that means that the sum of these integers is, is the same as the sum of these integers is the same of the sum of these integers because each band has to transform in some error. So if I count, if I add the number in one, two, three, and four, 
If I add them, then I get the total number of bands and here, similar here, okay? But there are more constraints. So in particular, if you consider this line here, so from gamma to X, you see that actually there's not only these points here are left invariant by the mirror in the X direct around KX, but the whole line, because it's, if I do a mirror about the KX axis, then this whole line is mapped to itself, okay? In other words, it's a meaningful question because this whole, this whole line is left invariant by this mirror. It's a meaningful question to ask if a band is even or odd under this mirror, it needs to stay even or odd along this whole line. And that's because this whole line commutes, or so this whole line is left invariant. So that means that the mirror symmetry is a good quantum number over this whole line. So that means that I can, the number of bands that are, is even for this mirror, so for this mirror along the KX, the number of bands at, that's even at gamma needs to be the, no, the same number that's even at x because each band that is even needs to stay even along the whole line because it's a good quantum number along the whole line. And similarly, the number, the, the number of bands that are odd needs to stay odd along the whole line, okay? So, and, and so that means that I can, I can check which of this, so these are the irreps and I can, they, the, these encode four fold rotations and both mirrors, remember? So I can I can check which one of those are 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 are, are even over uh, under this mirror in, uh, about the kx axis. Okay, so and that turns out to be uh, zero, two, and four, uh, and similarly uh, for the ones that are x, that turns out to be zero and two. I can just look up which one which of the symmetry operations are even. Okay. And then you also know the number of, of odd ones because this is basically, as I said, this is the total number of minus the to total of even, and that's why you get this equation. This N4 is a doublet, so that's why it appears tw twice, so it can be both an even and odd. But so what I want to say here is that I get, I have these numbers that count how bands transform in irreps at, at, at high symmetry points, but there's also gluing conditions of how they glue together. So if a band is even at gamma, it sh should stay even. Uh, along whole of x, and that gives me a constraint equation. Okay, and um, uh, similarly, okay. So this gives me two constraint equations for the even and odd. But of course, these are not mutually independent because I said this one, this one, the number of even bands is the number of total bands minus the number. Oh, sorry, the number of odd bands is the total number of bands minus the even ones. Okay, um, so. In particular, I can I can not only write down this constraint equation from gamma to x, but I can also write this constraint equation from x to m because this whole line is also left invariant by the mirror, but by, by doing a mirror in the ky direction along the ky axis or in the composition of the two mirrors. So these lines two, one, two, and three all give me constraint equations. Okay. So the only thing that I need to do is I started from this from these numbers here, but there's constraint equations. So I write down these constraint equations. But as I said, these constraint equations are not all mutually independent. So I take the rank of this guy. And when I take the rank, I, I find actually that there are five, era, five constraints, five mutually independent constraints. So remember that I started with 14 integers, like five here, five here, four here. But there's five constraints from this constraint equation of how things glue together. And that's why I get z to the ninth, OK? And this, this answer, because I started with 14 integers and now 14 loose integers and I have five constraints and I have nine independent uh, integers. And you might, you might wonder, okay, what is the significance of this result? Well, the significance is that this exactly is actually secretly doing this K theory that I told you about. So if you want to do this from a mathematical perspective, it's very, uh, it's, com it's complicated and cumbersome and, and very, very insightful, but here we just counted things. We just counted like high symmetry points, how bands transform, and there's gluing conditions, and out comes directly this, this answer. And this answer matches the KT perfectly for class A. Okay. So that's quite a deep, quite a nice result. And uh, there's only one caveat, and the caveat is that if I have a churn number, I need to add one more integer. Because remember that the churn number can also be defined for systems that have no symmetry. So uh, just a free fermion, I can I can have a have an have an, uh, a churn number, uh, but the churn number can can be added. But this is only the case when there's no mirrors, because if there are mirror, the the the, the like the integral of the churn number is actually odd. So when uh, when I uh, when I integrate that, uh, this will be zero. But so in this case, there's no addition. But if there's no mirrors in the group, I need to add one more. So this is the algorithm. Okay. Um, 
So, uh, and just as a, as a notion, okay, so this, this matches, so we can do this for any group that you want. So any kind of crystalline symmetry group that you want, these are the space groups in, in, in 2D and just out comes these answers. And it doesn't only work for what people call somorphic groups. So that are groups that uh, have like point group and translation separated, but also things that intertwine uh, uh, translations and point group operations. So for example, this is a symmetry that intertwines translations and point group operation because I need to do half a translation and mirror. So the mirror is the point group operation. So you see that I need to do half a translation and mirror. That is the, the uh, that's, and that's what's called non-somorphic, which makes the, the irreps a bit more, more complicated because they can have phase factors from this translation. Because if a Fourier transform it gives me a phase factor, but we can still deal with this. this you, you just need, instead of normal representation, you need to do what people call projective representation. My point is just, we can do this for any group we want, not only in 2D, but also for 3D. So if we have something like a cube, you actually find z to the 22, okay? So, um, so again, just to, to give the idea, the only thing that we did is just count how bands transform at high symmetry points and, and giving constraint equations of how they glue together and outcomes the answer that you actually, if you want to get it from K-theory is hard because it's twisted equivalent K-theory that does that, okay? And this, this idea that we put out in 2016 uh, December relates to this idea of what people call atomic insulin, oh sorry, what people call topological quantum chemistry and symmetry indicators in the following way. And the following way is that, okay, so if I have like this, uh, like Z to the ninth, it tells me that there are like nine integers that obstruct me to, if I have one phase and another one with different configurations of these nine integers of deforming it smoothly. So that means that if I, Again, in this, in this very simple idea, if I, if I think about this, that this one will have some configuration of this nine integers that's different from this one, okay? But it, a priori, that doesn't tell me which one is topological. I mean, here I can kind of guess because it, it went from one, it goes from red to blue. So obviously this one would be the trivial one. But if I have these nine integers that have a different configuration, it doesn't tell me because it's all in momentum space it doesn't tell me which, ba uh, which band structure. I, I know that there are nine integers that obstruct me to go from this one to that one or another one, but in momentum space, that's just two gap structures. It doesn't tell me which one is topological and which one isn't, okay? So, and that is, uh, but I do know that I get these nine integers to obstruct me to go from, or not, that, that map out all the classes in momentum space, okay? So these nine integers map out all the classes of momentum space, but it doesn't say which of the momentum space classes is topological, right? It could be this one or the other one. I just know that they are different because I cannot deform one to the other without closing the gap. So if I, in the simplest case, when I have two classes, I don't know if the left one or the right one is topological. I just know that they are topologically distinct, okay? And this is what symmetry indicators and, 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 and uh, topological quantum chemistry brought very nicely and insightfully to the table in some way because they basically gave a definition of what I would call topological and what I called uh, 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 non-topological from scratch uh, from a physical perspective. And the physical perspective is that if I can find a localized one yay orbital, so make localized orbitals on each side, then if I cut the system, I will not have edge states. If I'm not able to find a localized one year description in real space, if I cut the lattice, then this, because it's not localized, it will, it will leak through the boundary and I will get edge states. So for a topological, so it's just basically a physical definition. A physical definition would be if I have, an, if I have a, 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 a trivial insulator, I can find a localized one year description that obeys all the symmetries. And when it's topological, it's not, okay? And so now, because with our algorithm, we can look at all the different band structures in momentum space, how many different classes we have. I can check for each of these momentum space classes, whether they have an atomic limit in real space or don't. And if they do, then I know that they have to be trivial. If they don't, then I know that they have to be topological, okay? So that is the essential idea for topological quantum chemistry and symmetry indicators, that we know the whole, all different states in momentum space, but we need to divide out by those that are, I actually have a one year representation. And if I do that, then I, what, I'm left, what I'm left with is topological, okay? And so just to make this very really concrete, I can give you a specific example, okay? And uh, uh, so, so remember from, my, from the gluing conditions that, we, that, we, that I outlined that we found, 
I can, I can look at all the different momentum space band structures, but now I need to do the exercise of checking which of these classes have an atomic limit or not. And the way you can do this is actually in reverse by starting from real space, Fourier, Fourier transforming. And then I know all the ones that all these ones I can actually obtain from, from, from putting orbitals at the real space, at uh, localized orbitals at, 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 in real space. So these ones by definition are the whole set of atomic insulators, okay? So the way that works is to make it concrete, let's just assume that you only have inversion symmetry. So I'm putting things in real space and let's say that we have a square lattice, but let's, let's assume that I only care about inversion symmetry. If I have like the, the fourfold rotations and the mirrors and stuff, I can do the exact same exercise, but let's just assume we only have inversion symmetry, okay? If I only have inversion symmetry, then in real space, there's four position on which I can put my orbital. So I can put my orbital here at zero, zero or halfway through the bond, because then my invert, if I do inversion, it goes, the, the pattern is repeated, right? So I can put it at zero, zero or halfway through the bond here in the X direction, or in the Y direction or here. All the other ones are shifts. So these are called the maximum position in real space are called the Wickhoff positions. But any, so if I want to make a square lattice that obeys inversion symmetry, I only have four choices of where to put my orbital in real space. So I'm putting orbitals in real space. And then if I only consider, consider inversion, the, my, my orbitals can either be even or odd. So let's say that even is like a dot uh, uh, here, S. Uh, that's obviously an, an even orbital because if I do, uh, I mean, it's completely symmetric or odd, like a P orbital. P orbital will be odd because if I now do an, an, an inversion, blue and red are swift. So like, like, sorry, blue and yellow, blue and yellow are plus or minus. So, you know, P orbital is odd, right? So this, and now if I put these things in real space, I can Fourier transform. And because remember my algorithm that I talked about before, distinguish all the different topological phases in momentum space. And now I need to check which of this class in momentum space have an atomic limit. So what I, what I, if I do it the other way around, I start from real space and I Fourier transform, then I know that if I Fourier transform that these by definition have to be atomic limits because I, I, I put orbitals in real space and a Fourier transform. So by definition, I can, they, they are derived from a Fourier transform of orbitals in real space, okay? And now you see that if I, if I put this like even orbital at the zero, zero position in momentum space, so this is going to momentum space for so gamma X, M and Y, if this one is even, if I Fourier transform, I get the phase factor e to the power IKR, IKR, but I put it at R is zero. So e to the power IKR is always one. So if it's even in moment in real space here at the zero, zero position in momentum space, it will be even at all the, all the points in, in momentum space. But if I would put it halfway through the bond here, then I get e to the power IKR. R is now like half zero. It's shifted half in the, in the X direction. So e to the power IKR will give me a phase factor e to the power pi k dot r will be pi for, for, for these momentum points, okay? So, and then you see that instead of, so here it will be plus at the gamma point and the y point, but it will be minus one, it will now be odd because I get an e to the power i k r, which e to the power i pi is minus one. So if something would be even, it is now odd at this momentum points. Similarly, if I shift it in the y direction then e to the power i k r will give me this momentum point that get the minus sign. And if I put it in the one one in the half half direction, then here I get the phase factor pi. Here I get the phase factor pi. Here I get the phase factor two pi. So yeah, I get get back to myself plus plus minus minus. Okay. So I did this fast, but this is nothing else but putting orbitals, positive orbitals, and as many as I want, and Fourier transforming. And if I Fourier transform, I get these patterns of inversion symmetry uh, eigenvalues in momentum space. And remember, we only care about the high symmetry points and how the symmetry labels look there, right? That's the whole idea. Uh, and similarly, so if these are all the, all the different states that I can make by putting an orbital and Fourier transforming. This is what people call elementary band representations now or uh, in other language. But so if I put an even orbital, these four states I can make or any linear combination of them, okay? Similarly, if I would put an odd orbital, then of course, everything that was a plus becomes a minus because I started with, this, with an orbital that went from plus to minus so that everywhere you get an extra minus sign. So that's why, but so these are the eight basis states. And now you can see that indeed the whole, the whole the, now I have, so I need to, 
The whole idea is with my gluing condition or our gluing conditions, we can map out this whole space, but we need to cut out all those ones that have an atomic insulator, but are atomic insulated by definition. But these are all the states that span this space because these are all the things that I can make. So and then now you can see if, if indeed, if I have something that looks like, like topological that goes from A to B and B to A, where these are symmetry labels, for example, this one, I cannot write it as a linear combination of this eight states. So that's why it's topological. So that's the whole idea of topological quantum chemistry of symmetry indicators is that in momentum space, we have all these all this different classes in momentum space that is mapped out by the gluing conditions. But I take out all the ones that actually can be derived from, from a Fourier transform of atomic insulators, okay, which are this eight. And you see that indeed there are states like this one, like this is a turn insulator. This can only be written as a half combination of these ones. You, you see, so not an integer. So I cannot put an integer amount of orbitals on the side and therefore it needs to be topological. So that's what people call it split, okay? So this also brought about that you can actually have uh, uh, um, what people call fragile topology. And fragile topology is nothing else that uh, I have actually, I don't have like a linear combination of this, of this, uh, of this basis states so it's not an atomic insulator, but I actually have a combination with the minus sign. And you know, I cannot put a negative amount of orbitals on the side. I cannot, I can only put integer, like even integer amount of, of orbitals on the side. So this is, how, uh, this, I mean, I can only put so many S and so many P orbitals on each side or, or D or F, but so many even or odd ones. And so this combination here, one minus two is like the combination of two basis states that are atomic insulators but I cannot put a negative amount. So this one is what's called fragile topological. So I cannot make it by putting, I cannot make, it, it doesn't have a one year, uh, it does have a one year limit, but it's all, it's a difference between two topological insulators. So be, in particular, if I add an atomic insulating normal orbital, so if I add just an extra band, I can actually minus two plus two, then I can get of this minus, I can get rid of this minus sign and I'm left with one, which by definition was a topolo uh, uh, sorry, by definition an atomic insulator. And in, in particular, so I don't want to go into details, but in, in, indeed, if you have this kind of fragile topologies, if you add an extra band, you see that you can you can trace it by what people call like Wilson loop. So what you do, you you follow the the band of the real ends on, and you just check uh, if you if I have something topological. Again, the idea is I go from A to B and B to A. Then it turns out that you if you go around the loop, that they these have to the 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 one year, the, the one year centers need to travel. So that means that you have a Wilson flow. In other words, if something is topological, if you look at the Wilson flow, they need to cross. So they need to have crossings. And you see that these crossings go away if you add more bands. But I don't want to go into too much detail, but fragile topology for symmetry indicated stuff is nothing else but something that is a difference between two atomic insulators. And because I cannot put negative orbitals on the side, it has a topological invariant. But this topological invariant goes away by adding a trivial band. So this is not K-theory stable by definition. In particular, for this example, if I add uh, like a trivial band that is representation two, then this two minus two will go away and I will just be, end up in one, which by definition was an atomic insulator by just putting a P orbital on the zero zero side. So clearly that is trivial, okay? So that's the whole idea. So in the last part of the talk, uh, I want to want to uh, want to show you like some of the things that very very uh, um, pictographically, what the last the things that we have been have been excited about at, at this paper, which are like topologies that go beyond it. So once more, everything that we did in this in this uh, topological quantum chemistry and symmetry indicators is really like think about how bands connect. So how how do the symmetry lo labels look at different points? Then I got from our gluing conditions all the different topological phase and momentum space and topological quantum chemistry and symmetry indicators came with the great idea. Oh, I can check for each of these phases whether they have an atomic limit or not. And if they do, that class is, is not topological and that class is. And from the gluing conditions, we know we cannot deform one into the other without closing the gap by definition. So that maps out all the topological insulators, right? So then you would think you're done. But the, the exciting thing is that actually we're not done. And that is because there are now kind of topological phases, which we call, uh, which we call multi-gap or Euler topologies that come about by a completely different uh, idea. So the idea was of how things glue together and I, I, I divide out, uh, I get all the different class momentum spaces and I, I look at those which have an atomic limit or not. Now I will show you like something like topological phase that come about by a completely different mechanism. And the mechanism is, is as follows is that 
Uh, and this is why we also call it usually multi-gap topologies. These, these kind of topologies arise in systems that have more than two bands. So the other ones, I can do everything for two bands or I can, of course I can look per band, okay? But now let's assume that I have, oh, that we don't have to assume, we just look at a system that have three, has three bands, okay? Now it turns out that uh, I can make a wild semi-metal. So, uh, so that means that I have, have like nodes between one gap. So let's say that this, I have a node here between, so that, uh, I will call this principal bands, but don't marry, mind about that. Let's say we have three bands and I have two nodes between the first two bands and one node in the, in the, in the other one. Actually, there needs to be another node because uh, we know from wild semi-metals that they always need to have opposite charges. So this I needs to be minus I. I just call them I for the moment. Um, and uh, what, what I want to say is that uh, if you have a wild semi-metal, then you have a topological invariant over the sphere around this node, and you cannot have unbalanced topological charge. So if I have one topological charge here plus, then it needs to be a minus. So that's why I have here I and minus I, okay? But the idea now is that actually these topological charges of these nodes are not just simple plus or minus or just plus or minus the churn number uh, if one has more symmetries. So if one has C2T symmetry or PT symmetry, uh, which is just two-fold rotations time times reversal symmetry or parity times time reversal symmetry, it's very natural in almost all systems because almost all systems have uh, C2 or P, uh, sorry, only have C2. Uh, but C2T is just a magnetic symmetry. But assume that we have C2T or PT symmetry. The point is that this node now actually don't only have plus or minus charge within one gap, but they actually have non-abelian charges with respect to the, to the node in the other gap. What I mean with that is if there's three bands here, uh, and what, what, what you can show is that if you have a, a, a system that has C2T or PT symmetry, the Hamiltonian can be always written as a real matrix, so an ON matrix. And it turns out that these nodes now have non-abelian charges with respect to each other. So that means that I can label these charges as I. And, uh, uh, so, and in particular, if I have three bands, you can show quite easily that they are like, act like quaternions. So quaternions, you know, like if you don't know what quaternions are, they are just like very much like the Pauli matrices. So you have sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z. And sigma I and sigma Z, they anti-commute. So that means that Although if I start from a GET system and I make these nodes, I need to have opposite charges. What I can now do in momentum space, I can braid one of the charges along, uh, in momentum space, I braid the, the, the charges along each other. So I have here, I start from this configuration, I minus I, and I call this one K. So you see I have K minus I minus I. And what I do is and I, I, I take this node from the other GET and I braid them. So I, I, I move them along each other. I do I break them in moment, momentum space. These are nodes in momentum space and I break them, okay? And what happens now is that because they are have, so they have opposite charge within one gap, but non-abelian charge with respect to the other gap is that they can actually, because you know that if you do sigma X and sigma Y, they enter commute, right? So they pick up a minus sign. So you see, if I do this braid, this one goes from K minus I plus I, minus I plus I, they go to, plus i plus i because they pick up a minus sign of the braid. So this one goes from k to minus k of the braid, this one. But this node goes from i to minus i to plus i. And now I get to the really weird situation that when I look at one gap, so it's not a gap, but it has nodes, but just look between these two bands that they actually have the same charges. You see, they have now, instead of minus i, i, they now have this, the really weird situation that they have the same charges because of this braid that I did, okay? And you know that, so you can view this as like, like, like charges. If I have the same charges that they, so here the charges are, are, are opposite. So when I smash them together, they can, they, can, they can gap out. But here, because now I have, after this braiding, I have the same charges, they can no longer annihilate because the same charges, they just, they, they, cannot, they cannot annihilate, right? So what has happened is that I actually, and, the thing that if I have topological charges that they cannot annihilate already reeks like topology. And indeed, we, you can define like some topological invariant that you, so this is very much like a very curvature. This is very much like an analogon of, of a churn number. So what I can, I can define this Euler form. I don't want to go into details, but when I integrate this over the plane, what happened in the first situation is that it gives me zero because the, the sides, the, the charges are opposite. But when I integrate this now uh, after the braiding process, because the charges are the same within one gap, 
it measures that the charges are the same. So this Euler invariant measures how many of the same charges I have. And after this braiding process, I actually see, you see, I have, I have obtained the, the same charges. And again, I stress here, this is all done by like really braiding while nodes and momentum space. This has nothing to do with irreps anymore. I'm not looking at how bands transform at a high symmetry point. This is really coming from, in particular, I could have three, three bands with all the same irrep, which in the classification that I talked about, the symmetry indicators and, and the topological quantum chemistry is completely trivial because all the irreps are the same. There's no, there's nothing that distinguishes them, right? So this is really a new phase that comes about by whole, whole, like a whole new kind of process and we can link it to like this Euler invariant. And the whole idea is here that I can upgrade nodes between different gaps. So not within one gap, but the whole idea is why I can circumvent what people call Nielsen and Mia theorem. So the theorem that I need to come with, with, with opposite charges is that I involve the other gap here, okay? So after the braiding, I can get to a really weird phase in which these ones have the same charges, okay? So that's the whole idea. Um, I don't want to. So another way to view this charge is these are like the basically a band theory analog of disclinations in, in, in a biaxial pneumatic. So the, the way you can view it is people in biaxial pneumatics know that defects in biaxial pneumatics can actually have like non-trivial charges, like like non-abelian charges, and when you break them, they can minus sign. This 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 these nodes here are like def, like the like the disclinations of. Of, of, of a, of, of a, uh, of, of a biaxial pneumatic, which you can also encode with gauge theory and stuff, which I did in the past, but uh, that's not important. The whole, the, the real important thing is that after this braiding, I get, get to this non-trivial phase. And the whole idea is the, the reason why this works is really because SO3 here is not simply connected. So that means that SO3, if I, so everybody maybe know, uh, not everybody, but a lot of people might, might know like the Dirac's belt trick. trick. So if I do a book, if I do a pi rotation in the x direction and then in the y direction, or in the y direction, in the x direction, the book goes to the same thing. But the path, the path that I have traveled in SO3 can actually, is actually different. And the way, the, the way you can view that is, is that two pi rotations in SO3 are actually non-trivial. So to, you think two pi is the same, but the accumulated angle is actually topologically non-trivial. And the way you can view it is if you, if you take a belt, and I do a, a two pi rotation and I, and I try to undo it, I cannot do, undo it. But if I do a four pi rotation, I can actually undo the, the twist, okay? So it's really not about like discrete transformation, it's really like the accumulated angle that I get. And when you think about SO3, because there can be plus or minus, there's like two covers, it's really like if I do first X and then Z or, or, or Z and then X, that gives, can give you a minus sign. So I either travel this path or I travel this path, okay? And you see, I come up to different part, points of SO3, which of course are identified, but there is a minus sign, okay? So that's another way to view it. I, I don't wanna to go into too much detail. The whole idea is that if I have a, a system with C2T or PT symmetry, which, uh, which just makes the Hamiltonian real, defects carry non-abelian charges with respect to the gap next to them. So the whole idea is I've, I've braided now momentum space a node along the other node in momentum space, but I use that there are different gaps. Okay, and that's crucial here. Okay, and and the, the, you can see it as biaxial as disclination in the biaxial pneumatic, or think about like gauge theories of how to encode those bisons, or I can think about like mathematically a pass in SO3, whatever you like. The whole point is that just the the the, the nodes here carry uh, 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 like non non trivial frame charges. So really, the fact that if I, if I drag them along each other, if I braid them in momentum space, I can pick up this minus sign. So from minus I to I, I can get this really weird phase and I can get actually a topological invariant by integrating over momentum space, not over whole momentum space, but over a patch in the real ends on, I take this patch. So there's some term in the, in the, in the, in the, in the interior and some boundary term. I integrate this thing is very much like a churn number and it indicates whether these charges are the same or opposite, okay? Whether they can annihilate or whether they can't annihilate. That's the whole idea. And the interesting thing is that you can direct draw analogies with the churn number. So if you have two bands with the churn number, you can just write it as in terms of this, uh, this two by two matrix and this D vector here. Remember that we here needed the, the third band to do the braid with the third band or the node with the third band. And actually the simplest form is then like the, like the, the flattened form is this guy. And you can see that the Turn number and this Euler invariant are very much the same. So this is like really like the three band analog and stuff like that. Um, 
And okay, the most interesting part is that we cannot just do this for two or three bands or, or four. We can actually do this for, for a general amount of bands. We can get this multi-gap charges. So from the fact that I can braid uh, nearest neighbors. And the way that works is that instead of like what people call Grassmannian, so if I want to partition my system in two bands, if I want to partition them as, as two bands plus one or three plus one or two plus one, this gives you uh, like more interesting mathematical ma objects which are called flag manifolds. Uh, I will not go into the detail, but the point is that we can map this to higher dimensional spheres and actually calculate all these topological charges. That's the only thing I want to say. And we can make models very specifically with my with my dear friend uh, Adrian Bouan. Okay, so so we have technology of how to get the models for this for these topological phases, and um, uh, not only models, but we have also uh, like specific uh, signatures. So remember that in the simplest case, this order number comes in a three band model. And this feedback model is written like this. Now, when I quench with the system, that's the first thing we did as like looking at the physical signature. So sequentially means that I take my system suddenly that you know, I change the Hamiltonian from, from being a trivial Hamiltonian to this Euler Hamiltonian. Then the, your wave function, you, you know that time evolution is e to the power IHT. So I just wrote the IHT as cosine minus I psi T here. Then I can write this time dependent wave function like this. And what turns out that I can rename this vector here like A. If I have an Euler number, so if I have a non trivial Euler number, that means that this, this, this n is, 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 is twisting because this is what we said here. This n is like wrapping the sphere. Then it turns out that this, with this definition of alpha, then alpha needs to, to wrap the sphere twice. That's something we can prove. But the whole point is that this actually coincides with a fancy, if you like fancy mathematics, this coincides with what people call the Hopf map. So I don't want to go into details, but what, what happens is that the, the wave function needs to show these links and these links have a topological invariant of how many links there are. And this links is, called, is given by the Hopf map. And this Hopf map is exactly a one-to-one -one correspondence with, the, with this Euler classic psi, okay? So what happens is if I now start quenching the system then suddenly I start to see oscillations and these kind of spheres. And that's from the fact that they are linked. And the number of spheres uh, of how many links you have is directly proportional to the Euler number. So that's like after quenching, you can actually probe the Euler number. And the interesting part is that people have seen this in experiments. So three months ago, people on tra trapped ion systems, they actually saw this prediction. So two years later, that's pretty good. Um, and just in the last two minutes, I want to say like, it's, but it's not only like quench signature, but we, we also did like things in metamaterials. So in the metamaterial, so now we have this Euler number, which is a very different characterization as Turing numbers and the symmetry indicated stuff that I talked about in the first part. But now, of course, if we have Euler number, we can also add symmetries again and go and like expand again. And what happens if you add like crystalline symmetry, in particular, we were looked here at like hexagons and the metamaterial. So this is an acoustic metamaterial, like acoustic waves. You can prove that if you do this braiding, so you do this braiding between different bands, that this break needs to happen over high symmetry points. Because if I see six symmetry, if I bring one node to the other node, they have to do that in the C6 symmetric pattern. And what happens is that you then get this triple degeneracies and you get this finite order number. And long story short, is exactly what we see in this meta material. So we made one of these models that we have with this general technology. And you see like really like this, here you see like different nodes and different gaps and you see that they braid as function of the parameters. So we have seen like this Euler phases in, in, in the braiding in, in metamaterials and not only, not only for, for, for simple skirmions, but what I mean with that is that here integer kind of wrapping, but also for half integer wrapping in which the system becomes a bit more complicated because you have half integer wrapping of the, of the wave function and half integer of the orbital phase, but together they add to an, to an Euler number. And this is also something that we saw like lately in this archive paper, also in the metamaterials. So the same thing, like also an acoustic one. But not only acoustic metamaterials, but also in phonons. So in phonons, in real material, so this is with uh, collaboration with, with DFT people like uh, of the group of Montserrat, of the Tomeo and Montserrat. What we can do is like, we can also do this braiding between different wild nodes in, 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 in photonic, uh, sorry, in phonon wave. So this is a phonon, this is the phonon spectrum of, in this case, it's from, uh, from silicate, uh, sil silic silicate oxide. So uh, uh, an accessible material, and you see that if I put a little bit of strain, these wild nodes start to do this break. And what happens is that after we've done this break, we indeed find like there is a patch with the finite Euler class. So we predicted this in, in silicates for the phonons, but also for, al for uh, aluminum oxide. So these are in, in, in two papers. So I'm just saying that this braiding doesn't occur only quench or in metamaterials, but also in phonon spectra. And lately, 
And lastly, but also in electronic spectra. So if you do stress or strain on the electronic spectra, like the zirconium telluride or molybdenum telluride, we, we predict that this like this wild nodes, they do this braid and they become like the same charge and they cannot annihilate anymore. And actually it's a bit more rich because in that case, because I have the same charges, but I also in the system, I also have a mirror symmetry that because of the mirror symmetry, they need to find the nodal line. So because if they have the same charges and they smash together, they cannot annihilate because they have the same charges. What they do is actually form a nodal line. So in this kind of materials, you can also observe this oil topology indirect by looking at transitions from wild node to nodal line. And the last really interesting thing I want to advertise that we looked at this kind of material and this material actually has a structural phase transition. So what happens is that if I look at the C2T invariant planes, is that under the phase transition, the symmetry character of this planes changes. So when you go from D2D to D4 to D kind of symmetry, long story short, what needs to happen is that these wild nodes, because of the symmetry requirements, need to transverse the plane. So one wild node that was to be here needs to go to this plane because of the structural phase transition. So just take this material, heat it up, and then it turns out that actually these wild nodes do this braid automatically as well. So there's another way of doing this braiding, okay? So um, with that, uh, I, I just wanted to give an overview that we have this new kind of topology that come around by a very different methodology, really by braiding momentum things. We have uh, like very specific mathematics of how to address this kind of phases. So we can actually do this for very general things, which is a bit more mathematically intertwined. But there's also real physical signatures like quench signatures that have been seen in experiment or we have done this with metamaterial friends where they made these acoustic setups and, and saw the, the Euler phases. We also predicted in phonons, like, as I said, like silicates and, and, and aluminum oxide. And finally, also in electron systems where you also inter, as also another interplay with crystalline symmetries. And with that, I really would like to, like to thank you all for your, for your attention. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you so much, Robert. Um, this was awesome. Um, what we'd like to do is um, thank um, everybody for being here and also Robert for his time. And we'll now go to the session with um, 